first half of 2022, both stocks and bonds were down. You've heard us talk about the importance of diversifying beyond just stocks and bonds alone on this podcast. And if you're looking for an asset that can help you diversify your portfolio and provide a potential hedge against inflation and rising food prices, look no further than farmland. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Meb, I don't want to fly to a rural area, work with a broker I've never met before, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a farm, and then go figure out how to run it by myself. Sounds like a nightmare. That's where Acre Trader comes in. Acre Trader is an investing platform that makes it simple to own shares of agricultural land and earn passive income. They've recently added Timberland to their offerings, and they have one or two properties hitting the platform every week. So you can start building a diverse ag land portfolio quickly and easily online. I personally invested in, on Acre Trader, and I can say it was an easy process. If you want to learn more about Acre Trader, check out episode 312 when I spoke with the founder, Carter Malloy. And if you're interested in a deeper understanding on how to become a farmland investor through their platform, please visit acretrader.com forward slash meb. That's acretrader.com forward slash meb. Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about markets in general. You know, you guys put out a lot of great research and we'll get into all sorts of the corners of the world, but but why don't we start with just kind of what's the world look like today? I'm just thinking about kind of the broad macro environment. It's been a weird year for a lot of people, stocks, bonds, broadly, you know, down together in tandem. Here we are in uh, September 19th. We're recording this. What's the world look like to you today? What are you thinking about? I was just talking with a group of uh, young people who came in our business. And I said, you know, one thing I've learned about markets, one out of every four or five years, markets have a real rhythm to them. And every four or five years, you got to go through this retrenchment. And it was like unbelievably rhythmic, like 90, 94, 98, 02. And then it didn't happen in 06. You know, the Fed kept policy too easy, too long. And then 08, the whole thing ignited. And, and then, you know, we've been this period of, you know, easy policy sitting you know, for a long period of time. And now the thing has, you know, we've created some inflation and it's pretty hard to find opportunities in the marketplace where, um, you know, to create real upside when you've got a central bank, sorry, not a central bank, all the central banks that are tightening and pulling back and, and squeezing financial conditions. So this is a boy at, I saw a quote that this is the worst treasury market since 1788, which I don't know who was trading treasuries during the Civil War, but but it's been a it, you know certainly in the last 50 years, you've never seen anything like markets going down in tandem, bonds and stocks like this. But I you know the one thing I, I talk to a lot of young people about, you got to go through these periods. You hate going through them, but it creates a really good opportunity on the other side. Markets have to recalibrate. You know you get this frothy incredible demand and people want to, you know, generate return, generate return, generate return, make money. And then you got to recalibrate. And this has been a pretty painful recalibration. So today it's one where I think you got to, you got to have a ton of patience and a lot of cash and just sit on the sidelines for a bit. So it's not to give back too much. Yeah. So much of the investing world, like just like uh, such a big part of it is, is getting through the various cycles and not getting, you know, taken out of the game and not getting taken to the woodshed, right? Like you have to just survive the different parts and they can last a long time. You know, it's the topic we began this podcast with is, is something majority of our peers really, you know, a high inflation world haven't dealt with in their career, at least not in the rising sense. It was more of a declining inflation time, but while we're on inflation, I mean, that's, that's something usually and in, in the path of rates as hard as they are to forecast, that's something someone in, in your seat thinks a lot about. What's the framework right now for thinking about rates as well as uh, inflation? You got to be really careful about a lot of interest rate risk. I mean, I, you know, when the Fed tells you, I mean, boy, they can't be any more clear in communicating. We're dealing with inflation. I mean, boy, it's as clear as I've ever in all my years, including sitting on the Fed's Investor Advisory Committee for eight years. I've never seen them be, you know, it's like, read my lips this is what we're doing. And so that generally is an environment not generally, that is an environment where rates are going higher. So, you know, the thing I think you're reaching the 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 tail end of that the, those rate rises, but you can't mark that down yet because inflation is still sticky. 
And we got a we got a horrible CPI report, and you can't mark down that the Fed is done. I thought, you know, because you're seeing things like freight costs come down, commodity costs come down, supply chain easing a bit, that you know the Fed would get to a level and then pause for a while. But you know now you got to wait a little bit, and you got to just maintain your interest rate exposure. Listen, I think ten year Treasuries. You know, I don't think they're going to go much higher than three and a half, three and three quarters percent. But I think you got to be patient and cautious around it. And uh, no, that's that's what we're doing. This is, you know, you don't see this a lot. I think the Fed's doing a lot of we're going to tighten policy, and then I think they're going to they're doing a lot of praying alongside of it. It's like I hope this works because I don't want to keep going further because it'll take a lot of people out of jobs. But I think in the interim, if you're investing in interest rates, you want to stay shorter on the curve. I've never been more excited about one year commercial paper or, uh, or it's a six month commercial paper or one year corporate bonds because they don't go down a lot in price and they can, they actually clip yield. I talk about sort of the yin yang back and forth framework of qualitative, quantitative. We're a mostly quantitative shop here, but how's it work for you guys? You know, the fixed income world in my mind is, is like the most data driven part of the investment landscape. Was your approach a combo? Is it lean one way more than the other? I mean, I think it's really hard to do one or the other today because it, you mean, and I know you I know you're the same. I mean, when you're when you're quantitatively oriented, you've got to understand regime. There's something different. And a lot of pure quantitative is off of history. And here's what happened in history. So this should manifest itself again. And what we're seeing today is historic and unprecedented. So we tend to be more on the, I will say, we tended to be more, much more on the fundamental side, but we have really shifted to still fundamentally oriented. And I would say that's our base, our home base, but definitely shifted, shifted towards analytics, data assimilation, using AI where we can, and in a multitude of ways, not just trying to come up with signals for the economy, inflation, but portfolio construction, you know, stress testing, scenario analysis, the ability to use data is extraordinary today. I mean, it's extraordinary. So we tend to, you know, come at security selection, sector allocation, more from a fundamental point of view, but then, you know, signals, portfolio construction, we have really, I mean, that's been our biggest initiative the last few years is to get, get much more analytically oriented. Yeah. As we look at sort of this inflation cycle, and this can be kind of quantitatively driven comments or uh, just Rick's happy hour, best guess. But what do you think is like the most likely scenario? We obviously have the tail sides where things could go crazy and maybe your likely scenario is not a, a moderate. But as we look out sort of the rest of this year, next year, is the expectation inflation kind of moderating down from this eight and change level? Yeah. Moderating down, but not to the two, you know, the two factors. I mean, I think, you know, you'll see real base effects on energy and energy costs coming down. You know, we're going to get through a lot of weather and, and what happens, obviously, in the war and, and in Europe. And then food costs that have also spiked higher on the backside of this dynamic in Russia uh, or Ukraine. But, you know, that's going to come down. The big two are really tricky. One is shelter. You know, the Federal Reserve's trying to bring down inflation. You got to be really careful about not shocking the mortgage rate too high. We saw that movie play out in 08, and three quarters of the wealth in the country are in people's houses. You got to be really careful about that one. But, you know, unless the Fed builds a lot of multifamily homes, it's pretty hard to bring the cost of shelter down, as we've seen in the recent CBI. So that's the, you know, that is the big one we're watching. Like, how does that come down? And then the second one being wages, they're not enough humans for the jobs available today and wages and, and you know 80% of the jobs are in the service sector things like healthcare education restaurants hospitality and they're not I mean, there's help wanted signs on every door in those spaces so you know wages are going to stay firm for a while so you know i think inflation will stay sticky high but it's going to come down off of these levels and there's some pretty encouraging signs. I, you know, I said, the one thing I worry about is the Fed over tightens. I did this a while ago. I looked at how many jobs bring down demand for oil because oil prices are driven by supply, not demand. If you really wanted to shock demand, it would, you would have to forget to bring down oil 
don't know the exact stop, but you'd have to take a couple million people out of jobs to bring oil down incrementally. That's crazy. It's like, why would you ever do that? So, you know, I think some of these things are tricky to bring down. But, you know, you look at inflation expectations. I mean, two-year inflation is 235. You know, five, 10-year inflation is under two and a half. You know, markets think it's coming down. And, and I, I think it's generally right. It's just not going to get, we ran for 20 years under two. So, but two and a half is not that scary. And, and you know, as long as the momentum is improving towards getting inflation down. By the way, part of what I think nobody focuses on is you think about net disposal, as long as wages are reasonable, particularly for low to middle income, you know, you can run a little bit more inflation as long as your wages are high because your net disposable income is in pretty good shape. So I always feel like it's like a one word answer. We have to have inflation at two. But what if an inflation at two, but wages were three and a half? That's not a bad scenario. So that's part of why I think the Fed will relax and it's not as panicked as others about, gosh, we got to get this thing to two or, uh, or, or else. Yeah, I think the expectation certainly as we look to the polls and whatnot, at least on my feed, but uh, the vast majority says that inflation, we've hit the peak print. And I think the majority response says we're going to be closer to five to seven by year end. So we'll see if any more surprises are in the cards. So we talked a little bit about inflation and kind of where we are in the opportunity set would like to get to, I mean, there's so many macro factors going on. How do you think about allocating? And you guys are famously more unconstrained, I think, than a typical manager. And fixed income, I feel like many people, they think of fixed income, they just think of government bonds and treasuries, and that being about it. But you guys have a pretty wide opportunity set. Maybe tell us a little bit about what some of the choices on the buffet are, and then kind of what looks good at uh, this point. I don't remember ever, ever being in this situation around asset allocation and fixed income that the, the menu was so limited on what created positive return in the near term. And so this is why I'm so energized. However, there's a gift and maybe the gift of QT is I can wait and I can clip coupon. You think about where we were for two years. I use this example of Amazon two and a quarter years ago or so, they issued three year Amazon bonds at 0.25%. Think about who would ever finance Amazon at 25 days, just buy the stock. Like, why would you do that? But you remember rates were at zero. Now you can buy nine month Amazon at close to four. I don't know. Like, and by the way, if you can buy inflation break evens at two and change, I'm funding Amazon at four. My real rate is positive too. That's a pretty good asset. You have China Taiwan risk, you have Nord Stream risk, you have weather risk in, in for nat gas prices. You have, I don't know how far inflation is coming down. So Fed have to tighten FCI further. And by the way, there are a lot of assets in securitized and otherwise that I can hold one two year maturing debt, get four to five. I bought some AAA commercial mortgages at five and a quarter the other day. It was about a two and a half, three year average life. I don't know. I just want to clip four and five. And then come back in three to six months and say, okay, so has the, have the clouds parted? And in the interim, I can clip coupon. You think about where we were two years ago, you had to sit at zero. And now you can sit at four to five and a little bit higher. And then it could take a little bit of high yield risk, which you know, I think you should take a little bit of high yield risk. You know, you can get eight to nine. And you know, is the economy slowing? Yes. Is there, you know, could you get more default? You can make a lot of mistake at eight to nine. Remember, a couple of years ago, it's like three and a half for high yield. Three and a half. So anyway, that tends to be we're doing less in residential real estate because I think that's trickier for the housing comments. We're doing less in commercial real estate because I think there's some areas that are broken in, um, in commercial real estate. But I think credit, particularly in the front end, you know, and some of the AAA assets and securitized, and then, you know, it's hard sitting on your hands. You kind of have a world as the oyster as far as like all these fixed income markets. I mean, it's so varied. I mean, I'm looking down at kind of y'all's positioning over the years. And I mean, there's everything, I mean, on and on, an agency, investment grade, munis, sovereigns. What does the rest of the world look like? We haven't really talked that much beyond the borders. Is that something you guys opportunistically look at? Or is that interesting today? It seems 
a pretty weird spot we were at in the last few years of negative yielding sovereigns all around the place. What's the rest of the world look like today? The outside of the U.S. looks mediocre. You think about the ECBU, the Bank of England, I mean, you start over there, you've got a huge net gas, you've got a huge employment inflation problem with employment being solid, and but demand is going to slow, and maybe it slows radically if you have to literally create demand destruction to deal with this energy situation. And then, you know, you know so you might slow down things dramatically at the same time the central bank's tightening. That is not a cocktail for get me into more Europe or more UK. The only place that I think is interesting, it's the same place like in the UK. You know, you can buy some companies that are benched to gilts, you know, in the in the front end that are, you know, really good yield because I think the central bank, I think the Bank of England particularly will have to slow down because I think the economy can really slow. So that's interesting. The rest of Europe. I don't know, maybe a little bit of high yield, but not that interesting. China is super tricky, particularly going into party Congress, China, Taiwan, et cetera. So an EM, you know, with a dollar that strong. So this is part of why I fixed it now. It's like, what do I do to generate positive return? I clip a lot of coupon in safe assets. I tend to focus more in the US and I tend to go up the cap structure. You know, one of the interesting things, you know, you know, we do in Zona Unconstrained is we try and get, you know, when we don't, we're not taking a lot of beta risk in things like high yield or emerging markets. You know, you can do some interesting things by using call options and equity to get a little bit of beta in without taking, you know, we call it Delta One or, you know, outright stock risk. So try and get a little bit. Listen, if clouds part, the equity market could run a bunch. So, we carry, you know, we're creating a lot of income in our portfolios. You can afford to buy some upside convexity and things like equities. So we're doing a bit of that. But otherwise, you know, trying to get, if we can get a stable four to five to clients, that's pretty close to Nirvana for the near term. And you mentioned clients. Like, what is the traditional main concerns they're thinking about today? Is it is it inflation one, two, three, or is it some other things? You know, the big concern is this cocktail of everything negative in the portfolio. And nobody's had to deal with that before. It's like, you know, there was always you could hold on to something. And, you know, even today, you got crypto going down and you've got, I mean, it's pretty hard. And so the dialogue today with clients is just how do I keep the things stable in, you know, to find, to get to a better, to a better point in time. You know, the one thing that I think is going to manifest itself that's a huge deal is you're getting you're getting yield levels now that you know people there were the discussion was 60 40 is dead. I don't need fixed income. I could do I could do 70% equities, 20% alts, and 10% cash or something, real estate, etc. I think the pendulum has shifted big time. That I actually think 40 60 makes more sense that if you're a pension, you're an endowment, you're a life insurance company. If I can lock in these yields without taking reg cap risk or taking, um, you know, a lot of beta risk in the portfolio, I mean, every, you know, most of the big insurance companies I know were buying equities because they had to get income. There was no income and equities were giving you the income. You know, the penalty you take from a capital charge perspective is heavy. Like now, you don't have to do it. So I think, you know, everybody waits to think for things to stabilize. But I think this is a renaissance for fixed income. There is going to be a lot of money flowing in the fixed income. We just need people to feel like, okay, the Fed's pausing, time to come in. And I think it's going to be a tidal wave. I mean, literally, not just because I do it. I think it's going to be a tidal wave because these yields make a ton of sense. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of astonishing to see just how far and how fast we've moved. You know, I feel like the overwhelming narrative for my equity friends for as long as I can remember, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I see the sort of psychological impact it has when you were at zero, essentially interest rates, is that people felt okay with a very heavy stock and particularly speculative stock exposure because they felt like there was no other game in town as far as you know the fixed income space you know i mean you mentioned amazon at half a percent or whatever it was 25 basis points but moving it up to four or you know wherever we're getting close to being psychologically 
it feels like a lot of the air could come out of the room. We'll see. But a lot of the models that people like to discuss with interest rates at zero or go back to a lot more traditional <laughs> inputs at 4% than they do at zero. Are you, are you feeling that from kind of conversations and, and seeing it from the allocators too? I mean, if you go back to the 90s, you know, if you're trying to hit a 7% return, you could buy all fixed income. And then, you know, we went through this period, you know, between then and now, where it's, I have to do real estate, venture, private equity, I got to get my seven somehow, and I got to own loads of equities and hope the market keeps going up. If you can get, let's, you know, let's say I'm talking a lot about one year paper at four. If you can get a five, five and a half, you know, maybe I own some high yield, I can get closer to a six, but let's say you're in that five, five and a half range that's pretty darn close to the seven. And, you know, maybe I layer in some equities and I still have some private equity, but your weighting is going to be, boy, if, if you can get a stable five, like that changes the whole paradigm. Just definitionally, you would want, you don't need as much and you can keep your beta down. Your organic risk stays so much lower if you're clipping, uh, you know, particularly if you're doing the front end. It's a pretty big deal. I, mean, I don't know how people don't say, you know, earnings yield is only relevant to what is what you can do otherwise yeah you know if you could do if you could do otherwise and you can hide it a five i don't know it's got to lift your irr hurdle your return hurdles for everything else including taking a liquidity risk which was i mean what was the gig for the last two to three years get a liquid because that's the only way you get the yield well now you don't have to now you could stay liquid which is very cool I'm going to steal and uh, trademark that phrase, hide at five. So when people were uh, talking about a, a line for TV next time, I'll say hide out at five. I'd say tribute that to Rick. So when you think about the portfolio, and I know you're unconstrained, is there a broad target starting point in your head where you're like, you know what, my in my mind, if things are, quote, normal, it's like a third corporate, a third treasuries and a third agency or something like is there a sort of like starting point or is it totally like blank piece of paper what are we feeling by the way the beauty of being unconstrained means people think it's like it, it sounds like you're hanging from the chandeliers taking risk it's actually the exact opposite unconstrained means i can eliminate the stuff that has no value and focus on the stuff that makes sense and it's part of why i think you can create consistent return over and above the ag i mean the ag or you know gold lag whatever your bench do has always got stuff that trades like too rich negative convexity why own it so we tend to be i would say in most years we tend to be long carry i mean we tend to be long income so we have a heavier way to securitize and credit certainly relative to an index we didn't this year this year we were actually under just because of such a different regime but we tend to be use a little less interest rate risk and use more credit yield carry and you know our home base you know to get too technical is a duration of about two to three years that's low well, it's low compared to most right isn't the ag like up around like seven or something exactly exactly a little lower than that but yeah so we tend to be lower but then we create more income and that tends to be how we do it like i say we shift it around quite a bit like this is the most bizarre allocation we've ever had where now we're taking much less beta risk and, and honing in the front end and getting that yield. But I mean, the beauty of being unconstrained is to use all your tools. We sat in a lot of cash the beginning part of this year and, um, you know, use what's available to you. And I love using convexity and, you know, use the futures markets for creating better financing terms. Like now, you know, you can hold some too technical, but you hold some some of the treasury market and the financing because people, everybody short treasuries, your financing becomes so darn attractive to lend out your treasuries. And then you could use some hedges using using options that we're pretty aggressive about, you know, taking advantage of options market, futures markets, TBAs and mortgages, keep your financing, you know, finan people underestimate financing. Even as an extension about the financing, we talk a lot about investors thinking in terms of what they do with their cash it matters a lot more now than it did a few years ago when you know we tweeted out i said what you know out of curiosity what do you earn on your checking account or savings account i think i said and there were a few different buckets with the final being i don't know or i have no idea and you know that was a very significant portion of people which essentially for if you don't know is probably zero but there's so many 
services and, you know, investments today that, you know, you can pick up a, a few percentage points of yield on that type of investment with no risk there. So but if you're worried, you know, the risk is you worry about inflation, but you can buy break evens, inflation break evens, and you still clip a, a positive real rate. We haven't seen that in a really long time. What are some of the weirder places in fixed income you guys are willing to allocate to? So I'm thinking emerging market debt. So feel free to tell me some stories, tell me some names over the years where you guys, you know, or, or ideas even today that are outside of the normal plain vanilla opportunity set that most think of when they think of bonds. So I would say, I mean, I think the most, the, you know, most interesting are financing markets in and around the securitized marketplace where, you know, we've done all sorts of different financings, you know, where we've gotten, you know, in a commercial piece of, you know, a, an office building where, you know, for some reason people just need the yield and they're willing like today and they, they're willing to like, this is the craziest things going on today. Like we're buying AAA commercial mortgages at five, five and a quarter and cap rates are still are under that. So like people are willing to take subordinated risk or take equity risk at levels that make absolutely no sense. So I always find the anomalies tend to present themselves in a lot of these securitized markets. So, you know, one thing I've learned about investing, everybody likes to do the cool stuff that everybody's talking about and then CNBC is active and talking about. It's the stuff that requires you reading the document where there's real money to be made. And so that's, it tends to be a securitized market you know, there are parts of the credit converts, you know, no, not a lot of people play in the convert market, but if, you know, today's a tougher one because the equity market, but there are times where the converts get stupid cheap. I mean, I don't know how many times I bought converts, but they give you no value for the equity option. They, and and uh, by the way, they're, they're, you know, converts don't you never get, I'm saying never, don't get price, they don't price the option right. And so that's a place where, it's not that liquid. There are not that many names you could play in, but I love playing in that space because it's not, it's, it's not well trodden and you get some really funky dynamics to it. The other one, so I tell you, my, this is like my whole key to investing, which is a little crazy and I'll probably be out of work after this. But I find it's a really interesting phenomena that I trade a lot between like four in the morning. So I don't sleep a lot, but between like four in the morning and 6.30 in the morning, that um, where I call it the unchaperoned European trading hours. Yeah, you're, are you just trading with some poor interns? I don't know who's trading in them, but there's. it tends to be you get these extreme moves. And um, I, when I tell you, almost every day. And where, you know, there's a reaction to data is overdone. And so I find, uh, A, you know, it's quiet during that time of the day in, uh, in New York. And B, the um, you get these anomalies in Europe that I find are uh, during those hours that I find to be really intriguing to trade. What's your thesis for that? Is it just because the the desks aren't staffed or less liquidity, or is something else? I think it has a lot to do with just you know not a lot of people around, and you get one buyer or seller, and it tends to move the market, and it tends to move, or a piece of news comes out, and you don't have both sides of the equation evaluating the news. And it tends to be like how literally the number of times, you know, the first thing I do in the morning is I check, you know, my Twitter feed, I check everything to see what's going on in the world. And then I see like, why did the market move that much? And um, it's a real, I mean, you have to be, you have to trade it differently because you have to do smaller more often because the markets are not that deep. I find it's like the most quirky thing about markets is that it's not great for my sleeping patterns, but the, uh, it is, um, it's, it's wild about how that you tend to get it. Uh, I wonder, I should just study. Like if you just did the opposite during those hours, how you would do over, <laughs> over a year. But I, I guess reasonably, reasonably. I mean, you're obviously one of the biggest players as far as size. I mean, is that something when you're talking about these inefficiencies, is that hard to get enough opportunity on some of these trades? Or is it still, you know, the, it seems like they still present themselves. So, yeah, I think you got to trade differently in uh, in some of these markets. By the way, not just fixing the you know, equity market is unbelievably thin. So I just think you got to be, you know, a bit more, do a little bit, a lot of time, 
And, you know, when the market has some depth, you know, you take advantage of it. So I think it's different across that. But there's also, you know, I was talking about buying some of this, this shorter dated paper. You know, people, if you're running a high yield fund or you're running a big other type of fixed income fund, like oftentimes it's like, you know what, I want to sell my one year paper because it's not going to hurt me that much. The price isn't down that much. I don't want to sell the other stuff where it's down too much that you can buy like today, euphemistically today, but even today you can buy, um, you know, there's some size that comes out. And so, you know, part of why I think running high levels of cash in portfolios today is I don't think the opportunity set has shown its face yet fully. And so I think there's more to do, but it's definitely a different market. You know, I also find for some reason, the options market, the ETFs market gives you some pretty good liquidity at times, you know, versus some of the cash markets that can be stuck and or hard to transact in. So we're really sensitive to transaction costs. And, you know, I tend to move beta around using some of the big liquid assets, big liquid ETFs and futures. I try and do it, uh, try and do it more that way, particularly when markets are, are as liquid as this. But what else are you thinking about? Anything on your mind that we haven't talked about today where you're kind of scratching your head, you're confused, worried, excited? So, well, I would say, first of all, it's the most interesting time I've ever been in markets. I mean, there's- Wow, that's saying a lot from someone who's uh, EF Hutton Lehman, went through the GFC, COVID, uh, the internet bubble, man. No, I, I mean, I first of all, to figure out you know, try and come in every day and figure out, you know, this piece of news out of the Ukraine or, you know, this inflation number. I mean, it stuff is moving. And um, I, I, so anyway, I think it's, you know, the one thing that I think about a lot is uh, I read that book a while ago, the black, I think it's called The Black Swan. And it was an interesting passage where they said, what if you never read the newspaper and just reacted to prices moving? And you never saw the news and you just reacted to prices. I, just, I think about that a lot today in that, you know, you start about trading during periods, a time where it's not that active, you know, where there are not that many players and or you have a market that's incredibly thin today. I often talk about with the team, what if you ignored the news and just when the market went up or it went down, you went the other way. This is one of those environments where I literally think, and now again, would you ignore the news? You want to understand the big picture regime. And so do you need to know the Fed's tightening financial conditions? hundred percent. But when a certain way on the ISM data comes out, which tends to be survey oriented, moves with sentiment, I think more than people think, the news comes out and all of a sudden the market reacts. What if you just went the other way? And, and or the retail sales number came out. Interesting. If it's a big shift, maybe you got to think about it. If it's moved by a tenth or not, what if whatever the market went up or down, you just went the other way? I think there's a lot of money today or a lot of alpha in literally don't read the newspaper. I don't know if people read newspapers anymore or read it online, but don't read it. And or just look at what is what's the big picture, what is happening, and just price is way more important than news, and just follow price. I don't know. You go through periods like this that I really think there's some truth to that. And, um, you know, I think about a lot when you're getting some of these swings in the markets, just fade them. And, uh, you know, there's one other cool thing around that. I find that nobody takes risk or just sorry, not nobody. People don't like in these environments, don't like to take risk into the number. Meaning when you get an employment report, you get a CPI report or whatever it is, people tend to like, I want to see the data before I take risk. And it's actually the best time to take the risk because, you know, you see this a lot, not always, like if you get a devastating CPI report, not so good. But I think more than not, you want to take the risk into it. And I've done more and more markets like this, take the risk into it because everybody says, Whew, okay, that was all right. Now I can put money to work and the markets shift immediately because there's no depth in these markets. So I think, it, by the way, it's a hard thing to do because, you know, particularly fixed income where you want to, you know, this convexity, fixing of this convexity, the downside, equities of convexity, the upside. You want to always protect the down. But I find more and more today in these types of markets, like you got to take, you know, you got to, you know, hold your stomach tight and say, you know what, I'm going to take the risk into the number because that's my better upside. So it's really, I mean, it's, I, it's really acute today. 
Uh, and again, be careful how much risk you take. There was an old study, and there's kind of two variants of this. Maybe we'll get an intern. Listeners, hit me up. One was the old, just simple, like magazine cover indicator and trying to come up with, we could do it with Barron's going back long enough, but, you know, kind of trying to quantify that. I know some people have written some papers about it, but it's a little harder. The second one that I want to do is a slight variant of this, which is we're going to take the 50 or I don't know, the 100 biggest events of the last 100 years in the US. So whether it's Pearl Harbor, whether it's as long as the title wasn't stock market crashes, but just something very significant, and then run a a little uh, academic study where we poll people and we say, okay, here's the headline, I'm going to give you tomorrow's headline today. What do you think stocks are going to do the next day, week, month, year, right? And my guess is, that people, even with armed with some of the news, won't get it right, right? Or like it'll be either random or or opposite, which is kind of goes to the moving the different way part of what you're talking about. So it's been on the to-do list for a while. One of these summer sabbaticals we'll get. I'm not sure when, but... Completely convinced. It goes back to like that trade. Was it Beaks and the trading places? Like if you gave me the employment report a day early, I think I'd lose more money on it because it's actually, I mean, it gets a bit of this where people don't take a risk until you get the employment report. But that number, for some reason, the movements after it are erratic, to say the least. I, I, I've oftentimes felt like, particularly with that number, if you had it in advance, how would you do? And I'm not sure you do you do very well. This is a really good situation. So that you stay morally clear as well. Yeah. It's been a weird time. You know, I, I often say on this podcast, they didn't teach me negative yielding bonds when I took finance courses in college. And here we were the last few years, it's super weird. As we look to the future of fixed income world in the 21st century, is it something that like, is it a return to normalcy that it feels like to you? Or are there developments? Is there anything going on in your world that's particularly noteworthy that, you know, either we haven't talked about or you're thinking about when it comes to your space? It could be packaging, it could be online exchanges, you know, fixed income historically has been a very sort of peer to peer marketplace, not as easy to trade as a Robinhood account with with stocks. What's the future look like for your world? I am praying that one part of it is negative interest rates have lived their final day. That is the craziest strategy. It doesn't work. It kills velocity in the system. It destroys pension and insurance investment capability. I think it's crazy. It doesn't get any of the benefit. Anyway, I'm hoping never again will we see that scenario play out. Of the positive things that I think are going to play out, I think the development of ETFs and indices means there is going to be beta is going to be for free, you're close to free, and then being able to extract. And then there'll be, you know, part of why I'm energized about unconstrained is it's beta, I can get beta, like nobody needs my help getting into the treasury market today if they just want index like, boy, I think the ability to to do, use AI, use analytics, do portfolio construction, how do you extinguish the stuff you don't want to own? How do you create durable alpha? I think the more the world has gone to index, the ability to to create durable alpha is, you know, I'm super proud, like, you know, it's all public, but our, like, our unconstrained, it's had we're going to almost double a return at half the ball for three years, five year, 10 year numbers. And not because I have any great wisdom. And a lot of it is I just eliminate the stuff that's rich. You know, I think the world is going to move that way. I can get into an index, I can get into an ETF, and the world's going to keep going that way. But it just creates an investment arena that's really attractive. It, but you got to bring the tools to the equation, I think, that they're, uh, allow you to, to create what I, you know, we call durable alpha. So for the listeners out there, either investment advisors, individuals, institutions listening, you guys can handle yourself. So you can buy Rick's fund. But to those who are just kind of thinking about the fixed income in general, any general thoughts on portfolio construction here? I mean, I know you alluded to it a bit in the beginning, but you don't want to hear it kind of coming from you. How should people think about it? Say that they can't buy your fund or for whatever reason it's not offered, what would be the, the takeaway to think about fixed income for them? 
for the next few years or today? Take your pick. <laughs> I mean, today, to me, fixed income is just, you know, clip yield and, and get out of the way. But, you know, sometime between the next two to six months, listen, I, I mean, I think this is going to be one of the great experiences of fixed income. I did this study the other day, one of these monthly calls where I showed if spreads just go back to average, you create 10 to 15, you know, depending on how much risk you want to take, you get create 10 to 15% returns in some of the credit markets. That's equity. And uh, without taking equity, equity beta. So I think it's going to be interesting. And I also think there's going to be financing opportunities that are under the radar screen around some big areas of infrastructure spend, power generation spend. Anyway, those are some of the areas that I think are going to be really, really intriguing. The amount of money to get at the end of the world's going to get to net zero. And what I see, it's like $4 trillion a year that has to go in. There's going to be some really cool things to finance. And so whether it's project finance or otherwise, there's going to be some some fascinating things to be set up for over the coming years. As you look at your career and probably have had thousands, if not tens of thousands of trades at this point, what sticks out as the most memorable? Is there anything that comes to mind, good, bad, in between? My second year in the business, I've never forgotten, it was a bond called Hydrogebeck, 10 and three quarters to 10, which at the time was a 20-year bond, which shows how depressing that is. Anyway, I learned a lot about it. I mean, I was probably the best lesson I ever learned because I bought it. I thought it was cheap. And, you know, you go to school and you get, you get, you know, study hard, you get a 95. I studied that bond like crazy. And anyway, everybody soon realized I owned them all or I owned close to the wall and I got head kicked in, despite the fact I think it was ultimately right. That I will never, I didn't teach people to go through training programs or otherwise that you can be right in this market. But if people don't think you are, you're going to get your head kicked in. You hold that for 20 years or you just kind of accepted it and uh, moved on? I think I gracefully got out when the market presented itself and took my lumps hard and my boss, the link, was very patient. I think it's always useful to try to get the pulse of what's going on in the world and what everyone's feeling. So I'm pretty darn energized about today is space. It was getting a lot of attention and then when the world world came unglued of COVID, everybody was you know, pulled away. But I think there's going to be things to do in around logistics, around uh, transport works, around medical. I think space is, a, is such a cool um, opportunity set for the next decade or so. And that's one that I think is under the radar screen. But uh, I think satellite technology, I mean, you think about what GPS has done and how much it can impact commerce. I mean, that's the place that I'm always looking at, AI and space, where I think there's some really cool stuff to do in the, in the future. Obviously, more equity than debt. We did a whole series on the podcast a couple of years ago where it was focused on two areas that I thought were transformative in the startup world, where I kept seeing a lot of opportunity that was being ignored. And I, I think you're starting to see some incredible developments in both. And we did a series on both. One was uh, on space. And what was interesting to me was always that that was the domain of very large companies, Lockheed's, the Boeing's of the world, but you're seeing a ton of innovation on much smaller now, and they have the ability to to do that. And the other was Africa, where you're starting to see a lot of very real successes happen. Hopefully, both are trends that continue, but it's really fun to watch. We watched our first time. Um, I took my five-year-old, probably a three-year-old, four-year-old time to uh, watch both of our first launch up at... um up the Vandenberg, up the road here in California. So I saw a Titan Heavy launch. <laughs> Very cool. Almost missed it looking in the wrong direction, but saw it. <laughs> By the way, the other one I would throw out is bio, is some of the biotech, like being able to deconstruct DNA. With I mean, I think for the next five to 10 years, we're going to see some unbelievably cool developments. It's so hard, you know, unless you have a PhD in some form of chemical engineering. It's so hard to figure it out and where to go unless you're a true expert in the space. But that is one that also I think is going to be, I think we're going to see some unbelievable developments there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm excited about it. Uh, that's an area that I think I, I agree with you. You're starting to see these little traces of success and, and just the sheer amount of biohackers that are interested in the data that's coming out. It's going to be fun to watch. Rick, I'd love to keep you all day. It's been uh, a lot of fun. We'll definitely have to have you back uh, in the future. For the people that are listening, they want to 
keep it going they want to read some more of your stories and reports and research what's the best place to find you you know i think I just on the black rock website when you search you know down uh you know we do a lot of a lot of blogs and a lot of you know what you said earlier a lot of uh you know, I tend to go off the reservation and try and apply life to the markets. And we do a lot of cool stuff on there, but it's, you know, through the, through the website, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And we do, we're doing stuff on Twitter and otherwise, but I appreciate that. So you guys do a great job with your charts. So we'll add some links to the show notes listeners on some of the, they do uh, some really beautiful charts on the research reports. Rick, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the fun. <laughs>